Good morning. I'm Peter Burke. I teach at the University of California at Berkeley, and I'm here today with Bob Solo. Bob was my thesis advisor some 35 years ago, and we're going to talk a bit about what happened then, what happened before, and what has happened after. Bob? To, to you and to me? Mostly, mostly to, to you. you. Oh, <laughs> oh, all right. Well, now, uh, uh, where do you want to start? Well, I know that you don't really love to talk about yourself, so I thought I had to provide some sort of um, incentive. Yeah. So I want you to imagine, which is true, that I have a couple of students who are about 21 years old and married to each other, one micro and one macro economist. Mm -hmm. And I want you to think, what is it that you could say today that might be helpful to them over the next 60 or 70 years? <laughs> and that um, might get you in the frame of mind to be willing to talk a bit about things. Well, if you're married to each other, I, by the way, am also married to an economist, uh, although not a microeconomist, an economic historian. And uh, I think what, what I would tell a 21-year-old student right now is that it's going to be a lot of work uh, to learn some mathematics, uh, but don't let it get away with you. Uh, focus on what you're interested in. Find something that really gets to you and work at it uh, very hard. It's still a good subject, uh, although, uh, you know, People make jokes about how many economists does it take to change a light bulb and all that. Uh, I don't, uh, that doesn't bother me, and I don't think it should bother your young 21 year old uh, friends. Uh, people always make a little fun of those who know something more and something harder about things that people, ordinary people who haven't put in the study, think they know about. So uh, uh, it's, it's not easy, but it's worth it. So now I want to go back a ways in your life. Yeah. I, I did read the little blurb you wrote for the Nobel Committee, uh -huh. and I thought there were a lot of things that sounded very pointed in it. For instance, immigrants. Your grandparents were immigrants, if I recall. Yes. My mother, I, the, according to the family story, my mother was actually born en route. Uh, from some place in what is now either Poland or Lithuania or something like, uh, like that. And uh, uh, the interesting thing about my parents, my mother and father, is that I thought, even as a kid, and I still think now, that they were very smart people. They were very intelligent. And uh, both, neither of them got past high school for the simple reason that, A, they couldn't afford to go past high school, they had to go to work, and B, nobody in this family had ever probably got as far as graduating from, uh, uh, from high school. So uh, I was uh, a smart kid in school. I had no trouble getting, getting good grades in, uh, in school. On the other hand, uh, this is Brooklyn, New York, by the way, in the 1920s and early 1930s. Given a choice between reading a book or studying something and playing stickball in the street, I go for stickball uh, every time. But, but the, the truth is I never had any, any trouble uh, getting grades in school, never, never really had to work hard. Uh, at all, uh, but uh, it was never in my childhood taken for granted that if you're a smart kid, you uh, you go to college, you uh, go to graduate school, you do something uh, intellectual or academic. That just that happened to me along the along the way. Uh, uh, is this the sort of thing that you really want to talk about? Well, partially that, but I'm sure you put the word immigrants in there for more reason than that. 
I suspected that since it came right before public school and a good public school too, you were pointing out that uh, we have a nation of immigrants. Well, uh, yes, although I, I was writing the thing that you're referring to not with any particular audience in mind, but uh, I, what I really wanted to express is the sort of thing that I'm, uh, I'm telling you now, it, that not only are we a nation of immigrants, we were in the 19, I was born in 1924, we were then uh, a nation of generally uneducated and, and not very well off people, immigrant or not, immigrant or, or native born. And uh, I, I just wanted to get across the fact that uh, this happened very quickly in the course of one generation. And, th and that I think is really interesting. And, and as I say, neither of my parents spoke with an accent, so uh, they might just as well have been uh, uh, native born. The, the point is, they came from a, a lower middle class, rather lower middle class uh, background. They did go to high school, after all. And, uh, and their, their horizon stopped there. And, and that has so dramatically changed in the society. That's the sort of thing I wanted to, to get at. And wh what about the role of public schools? Well, yes. Uh, that's an enormous contrast. Uh, you're going to be going to New York City. Uh, in New York City in those days, I was born and brought up in, in Brooklyn. The, the public schools were not all good, but most of them were very good. Most of them were, uh, well, you know, the paradox there. Uh, so I started in, uh, in first grade in 1930. That's the Depression. And uh, a job as a school teacher in a public school in New York City was a plum in those days. And so I think that we had uh, some very smart teachers as well, people who today you know, making the rough equivalents that you have to make would have earning power far beyond that of a, of a school teacher. And the, the public schools were, uh, were excellent. My, my high school, James Madison High School, was a, a, a local school. It drew, it was no, wasn't a selective school at all. Everyone for blocks around uh, went there. It was enormous by modern standards. We had 10,000 students at Madison High School, and it was double session. You either went from 8 in the morning till 1 in the afternoon, or from 1 in the afternoon until 6, either freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, I can't remember which. Uh, but the, the teaching was good, and the kids were, were very good too. They were and, and upwardly mobile. It was a, I think that's the key thing. Uh, when I said I'm the first person in my direct family to go to a college, that wasn't rare. I suppose most of my my colleagues in school, friends in school, those who went to college, which were quite a lot of them, uh, were the first in their uh, in their families. So that, uh, that, that the melting pot story was working very well in New York City in the 1930s in the Depression, in spite of the fact, of course, that, that uh, well, I, I give you this as an example. My friends, my, my parents had a friend named Louis Ginsburg who taught math in uh, uh, the junior high school the junior high school I actually went to. I can remember, just from overhearing conversations, when uh, everybody thought of Lou Ginsburg was 
he didn't earn very much as a, as a math teacher in Brooklyn. And then a year or two later, everybody envied Lou Ginsburg because he had a, a civil service job. He wasn't going to get fired. He was the, what everyone wanted to be. Uh, and, and so you ran into an English teacher, I presume, yeah, who well, got yes. you interested in literature? Yes, that, that, but that's the sort of thing that I suppose happened to, to many people. As I said, I was just a, 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 a street kid, uh, played ball, read books, read books. And uh, in my senior year in high school, I had, there was an elective course that I took about European novels. And uh, the teacher, uh, Mrs. Tauster, her name was. She was a very interesting person. She had a, a very left-wing background. She was an anarchist, and and she had been the famous American anarchist of the time was a woman named Emma Goldman, who spent quite a lot of time in jail, actually. And Mrs. Tauster, before she was married, and started being a school teacher had been the secretary to uh, Emma Goldman. But she, she taught this uh, course, and in it, we read a whole slew, it took all of my senior year, we read a whole slew of, uh, of really the great European novels. We read Balzac, we read Stendhal, we read Voltaire, we read Goethe, not a novel, we read Faust, we read Flaubert, we read Dostoevsky and Turgenev. Uh, we read a couple of Chekhov plays. We read Tolstoy. You know, one of each. And, uh, and that teacher and her husband actually sort of took me in. And uh, uh, they took me to concerts. I'd never been to a, a concert in my, in my life. And they discussed with me as, as if I were a serious person. I was, in fact, 15 years old at, uh, at the time. And, and that, I, that was the first time I was ever interested in ideas for their own sake. Uh, you know, isn't that something worth thinking about? So that, that was a big change for me. And, and I would normally have gone on from Madison High School to Brooklyn College in the, in the, uh, the, the city's free university system. And, uh, and Mrs. Tauster and her husband said, no, 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 you've got to uh, apply, uh, I think, just to Harvard and Columbia to, and, and hope to get a scholarship and go there. And, and so I did, and, and I did get a scholarship, and I went off to Harvard as a, as a freshman. And I was, when I got there, I was behind the prep school kids, the prep school freshmen. They had, they had had, I don't think they'd had a better education, they'd had a more extensive education. They had done things in a way much more like college students. But uh, by the middle of my freshman year, I caught up with, uh, with them. So uh, you could say I graduated from Madison when I was 15 and a half. I said this, this enormous school of 10,000. We graduated one class in January and one in June, then the next January and the, the next June, a thousand at a crack after all. and. Uh, uh, so I graduated at 15 and a half in January of 1940, and I had to wait until September to, to go off to Harvard. Uh, but that, that senior year uh, certainly changed my life in both those, in both those respects. So. Then when you got to Harvard, you ran into some very interesting people early on. I never would have guessed that you'd known Talcott Parsons, for instance. Well, uh, th yes. 
I, I came to Harvard, and, and of course I had no idea what I might study. I had thought of, of studying biology for uh, a characteristic reason for the time. It was the Depression. I came in 1940, it was the end of the Depression, September 1940, but my, my attitudes had been formed in the Depression and someone told me there were always jobs available in the Forest Service. And I thought, well, a job in the Forest Service sounds, sounds pretty good, uh, so I'll study biology. And I did, I took the freshman biology course, and I, 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 I did okay in it, I got an A, but I knew it wasn't for me. Uh, uh, I, I, the lab work, I could get through, but it, it wasn't clicking, you know, it wasn't zinging. So I sort of drifted into uh, the social sciences because uh, kids of my age in 1940 or 41, were very conscious that the, our whole society had broken down. We had just lived through the Depression. And, and um, in fact, the Depression really was brought to an end by the war. Well, Depression and war are not exactly what you look forward to. So uh, we, were, we all thought that, that, that things were, were busted and needed fixing. So I drifted into the social sciences. And I happened to become friends with uh, a graduate student of sociology who, who became a very well-known sociologist, Marion Levy, his name was. He ended up as a professor at Princeton. Uh, and uh, uh, he impressed the hell out of me. He was the, the smartest, most knowledgeable person I, uh, I knew. A Jewish boy from Galveston, if you can imagine, that combination is really uh, is really something. And and Marion was a, a an enthusiast of talk of Parsons, and he told me you got to take a course with some courses with Parsons. If he had told me you've got to jump out the fourth fourth story window, I would probably have done that uh, uh, too. But I, I took the course and, and got to know uh, uh, Talcott. And I, I enjoyed the, the sociology. But I, there was a paradox in Parsons as a, as a sociologist. He thought of himself and the profession thought of him as a theorist. And I found the theory uh, in excessively complicated with very little, for all of the assumptions and palaver, you got very little out of it. On the other hand, Parsons also taught a course on the sociology of the professions, and he would lecture on how doctors are and how lawyers are and uh, what it is to be a professional in that kind of thing. And I thought he was full of the most fascinating insights of the way doctors behave and the way lawyers uh, behave. And I think he would have been, uh, his, his theory, his theoretical work is out of fashion now. Uh, I think if he had, if he had his way of, of connecting theory and data, the data were not statistical data, they were observation data, but his way of connecting them was not very good. Had he been able to do that better and get from data, from these observations, a little more induction and a little less fantasy would have made uh, a tremendous uh, difference. So there I was. I, I did quite a lot of sociology. I did, I did some anthropology. And I took a course or two in economics as, uh, as well. Uh, but I, at that time, I didn't think of myself as going to be an economist. Uh, I didn't, to tell you the honest truth, I didn't think of myself as being anything in particular. I was just doing what I did day by day or 
or semester by semester. And then, and then uh, came Pearl Harbor. And that was a, a, another big thing for me. I can remember where I was sitting in a psychology class when I heard about Pearl Harbor on, in, on December 7th, 1941. And uh, I was then not yet 18. I was 17 and a couple of, uh, of months. So uh, I thought that that uh, uh, beating Hitler and the Nazis was the most important thing going. Uh, and, and so when I turned 18, I joined the Army. I volunteered for, uh, for the Army. And I, I've, I've never been sure in my own mind how much uh, this, why I did that. Was it how much of it was uh, gung-ho, this is the important thing for, for my generation to do, so let's do it. And how much was, I'm getting a little bored with sociology <laughs> and, and getting a little bored in general, and maybe I should just uh, pull up roots and go somewhere. So I, I, I did. I, I went down to a recruiting office somewhere and signed up, and they said, okay, uh, but they give you an induction date several months in advance, so I think it wasn't until November of 42 or something that I was actually in the Army. Yeah. And then you spent the then I spent war in Africa and Italy? Well, I spent a little bit of time in Africa. Uh, the fighting was over by the time uh, I got to North Africa. Uh, but uh, then Sicily and Italy, and I spent most of the war in Italy. And uh, uh, was, well, so did so did several thousand other people. So it was uh, it was just something one did. I had an interesting job. It was uh, rare, I think, for the army to to assign people to do thing do something that they were actually good at or or had some qualifications for. And they, were, and they were accidental, totally accidental. I had two talents. Talents is the wrong word. Uh, I had two skills. Uh, I knew German very well. And I'll explain how that happened. That was an accident. And I knew Morse code very well. <laughs> and that was a pure accident. Uh, I knew German because when I arrived at Harvard College in September 1940, I had a randomly chosen roommate who was a German refugee, Gerhard Melhaus, uh, and we became uh, fast friends. He died a few years ago, but we were friends until, uh, until he died. And I was, I was clever enough to say to myself, here, this is an opportunity. Uh, why don't you take the elementary German course and the next course, and then when you were hanging around the room in the evening, you can practice your German on Gerhard, and uh, and you'll you'll uh, learn it better and quicker. And I did, and within two years, I I, I could pass for uh, a German from someplace else than here. If I was in Austria. Uh, people would ask me whether I came from somewhere in Germany. If I was in Germany, I could, uh, I discovered this later, I could pass myself off as an Austrian. So I knew German. And I knew Morse code because the psychology department at Harvard had a contract with the military to find ways of speeding up and improving the teaching of Morse code. And so they advertised for anyone who wanted to turn up three evenings a week in the basement of Memorial Hall and, uh, and get taught Morse, Morse code. And I must have been bored <laughs> 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 if I would put in time learning Morse code, but I did. And so I, I was pretty good at uh, Morse code. And I got assigned by the Army to uh, a tactical, short-range uh, 
radio intercept company. Uh, what we did was uh, sneak up as close as we could and intercept German radio traffic. Uh, this was not like the the like uh, uh, touring in Bletchley and you know breaking enormously difficult codes. This was some of it in plain language uh, and some of it in in very simple very simple codes and our our job was to copy this traffic and and read it if it was uh, if it was encoded decode it and then report it to whoever could make use of it and it was very small scale local uh, uh, stuff uh, like uh, there's going to be a delivery of machine gun ammunition at 6 p.m. tonight at such and such map coordinates, and if we could read it, we could make sure that the delivery of machine gun ammunition was properly entertained by uh, local mortars or a fighter bomber or something like uh, like that. And and uh, it's all this, actually to tell you the truth, uh, this function was good for my my self regard in a way because it was not a desk job. This, this, these radios that we were using and listening to were not powerful, so it was line of sight. You could not hear what, you could, what your antenna could not see. On the other hand, we had to be, we had to, to be covered somehow because we did this work in built up two and a half ton trucks and they were sitting ducks, if anybody saw us. Uh, uh, 288 shells would blow the whole thing up. So uh, it, was, it was serious enough uh, and close range enough so I didn't feel like a back office uh, guy. On the other hand, my probability of surviving was always pretty high, and, and so I did. And we were very good at this. We got we got to be the 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 British had discovered the possibility of doing this short range radio intercept tactical radio intercept. They had discovered it in in Africa during the the campaigns in Libya and Tunisia and uh, and places like that, where the communication there there was no other means of communication, so everyone had to resort to the radio. And uh, uh, so we picked it up. In fact, we picked some of it up from them. And we got to be very, very good at it. Mm -hmm. So it was a high morale outfit. And, and, uh, and uh, I, we have only just stopped now, 1945, 20, 10, or 11. That's 65 years. We've really stopped being in touch with one another. The, the numbers dwindled away. Uh, so we used to have occasional reunions, uh, and, and we were very close, a uh, very close group. Now, what came out for me in reading the very short version of this was uh, the teamwork and being part of an enterprise that worked properly yeah, rather that, than was dysfunctional. I love that. I love being part of a, of a high morale, high productivity group of people who, who work together and, and depend on each other. And we did. We had different functions. And the, actually, the, the Army did for me uh, something that uh, uh, needs to be done. I spent those two and a half years in Italy with a, a group of maybe 110, 120 people from, as they say, all walks of life. Uh, uh, some of them were barely literate. Uh, uh, some of them were, like me, college students, or I, I was fairly young, uh, but college graduates, lawyers, uh, and, but also uh, guys from Oklahoma and, uh, and Kansas 
who uh, uh, had barely got through school, but had learned to be radio operators or, uh, or drivers or wiremen or, or whatever. And we were all friends together. And uh, it really was the, the all walks of life thing. And I got to know, uh, not only got to get to know, but to, to like and admire uh, uh, a whole different, a whole broad range of, of people. And we were still uh, as different as could be when we had a reunion, got together, uh, but we were still buddies. We were still friends. And so somewhere in all this, you met your wife. Well, I had that, I had met my wife uh, between the time I I signed up for the army and the time <laughs> I had to be inducted. So I I met this girl, and and uh, oh, we had sort of half a dozen dates or so in a matter of a month or two months, and. Uh, and that was about it, and and then off I went, and uh, we, uh, you know, by that time, after those those two months, we knew we wanted to get married, uh, but uh, twenty four dollars a month was not a lot of pay, so uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, we didn't. Uh, we wrote a lot of letters, and uh, and uh, and we got married. I think seven days after I got back in 1945, and Bobby, that's you, as you know, is my wife. She says that she never understood how her father lived through it. <laughs> Here's the older of his two daughters marrying this guy whom she hasn't seen in damn near three years, uh, and whom she hardly knew anyhow at the very beginning. And, uh, but somehow he gritted his teeth. Her mother had died when she was young. Uh, he, he gritted his teeth and lived through it. And so, well, we've been married for 65 plus years, so I guess it was okay. And so I had a, a strange experience. Uh, just before I came, a student walks into my office and says, I want to be an economist. I've taken all the economics courses and all the math courses. What should I do? And, and I thought, what am I supposed to tell him? He's done everything. And uh, after talking to him for a few minutes, I discovered he'd never written a paper. Nothing ever longer than 10 pages in his life. I, I would immediately call the dean or the head of the department and say, we're laying down on the job here. <laughs> uh, that is amazing. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Uh, and he had never been required to write a paper, and, and, which is hard to understand, and he would never thought by himself of doing that, which is easy to, to understand. That's not a, an action that comes naturally. You have, that's part of the culture that you have to learn. Uh, so I hope what you, was, by the way, was this an undergraduate student or graduate This is a, an undergraduate, an undergraduate who's student. about ready to be a graduate student. Yeah. So I hope you gave him, uh, set him off to find a topic to write a paper for you. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and explain to him that, and, and, I'm, and you'll send him to graduate school. Eventually, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, but that, that is amazing that that nobody had asked him to do that before. And, uh, and no one had asked him to take a course in sociology or anthropology or almost anything else. Yeah. It, it was a very strange discussion relative to yeah. what I knew when I was that age. Yeah. Apparently you had a, an experience that was yeah, yeah, we had a, the, the, much different. The degree of specialization in education now, in our college education, is 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 really excessive. They do the same in England, but English secondary schools, or at least they used to, the secondary schools that bright kids went to, either the the fee-paying schools, the, the what they call public schools, or grammar schools, uh, they had very broad and very serious curricula. 
but a lot of our high schools uh, don't. And then a kid goes to uh, goes to college, and and if if he or she is ambitious, uh, begins to specialize, at, uh, and that that's that's not good. Uh, I, w when I had questions like that occasionally from MIT undergraduates, I would say, read something. They'd say, read what? I'd say, read anything. <laughs> I don't care what it is. Just read something. Uh, but, but writing something is also uh, trying to think something through, trying to, to solve a problem and explain it to others. Is, is, is there's absolutely no reason why a 20-year-old, 21-year-old junior, senior uh, can't uh, can't do that, and uh, uh, that's uh, that that's too bad. Uh, there's I've I've never much believed in in what they call general education for college students. Uh, I'd much rather that people, instead of doing a course on Western culture or something like that, find something they're interested in and, and pursue it, whether it's uh, sociology or English literature or Eastern religions. I don't, I don't care what it is. Just find something and pursue it and learn something about it. Think about it. Yeah. Terrible. Of course, that's California, Peter. And, uh, I would not be so <laughs> sure. <laughs> So I guess we get to after the war, and how did you get interested in growth theory? Now, I know you ended up at MIT, yeah. and I know you learned a little statistics at Columbia because they didn't seem to have it up this way. Yeah. Um, and I know that FC Domar was probably in the department already. Uh, I'm not sure about the exact timing there. I think not. You think not? I think not. I think I had already... Uh, written a paper on growth theory before Evsy showed up. I'm not certain about that, though. I just don't remember. Uh, I got interested in growth theory because it was in the air. Uh, remember, the think of a year like 1951 or 52. Uh, this is five or six years after the war. Uh, the the decolonization of the colonies, you know, the French and German and British colonies had already taken place. And uh, the idea of economic development, of, the, of growth in, in relatively poor countries, was already in the air. And, and I had certainly read Harrod and Delmar, because Evzi's first paper on that subject is 1946, I think. And I'd read that, and I had read Harrod, who wrote in 39, and then again in, uh, uh, I can't remember when, a little after the, very little, shortly after the war. So there was discussion of that, and there was a nice little book by, by William Baumol, uh, published it about that, uh, about that time, so the the subject was uh, was in the air, and I think that's where I picked it up, just from the atmosphere. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, but the the main thing is, you get uh, you don't need just to be interested in something; you have to have an idea. You have to have something you. You, there's got to be a puzzle, something that, that you, you think is wrong or that you don't understand and you want to understand. And in my case, I think it was the fact that the growth theory that I read, which is to say Harrod and Domar, all had this air of instability about it, the, both of them seem to come to the conclusion that unless things were just right, just perfect, things that had no particular reason to be just perfect, uh, then the uh, 
a modern industrial capitalist economy would be subject to long periods of persistent unemployment and worth perhaps worsening unemployment and long periods of excess demand for labor. And, and I knew enough history to know that that wasn't so. So I figured there, there had to be <coughs> something missing in, in, the, in Harrod and Domar. And, and it had to be something that would enable uh, a modern, a, an advanced capitalist economy to grow for long periods without that tendency to rush off to excess demand or excess supply of labor. And, and so I, uh, I eventually found one such thing, and I, it turned out it made a nice model. And I knew a nice model when I saw a nice model. Uh, and and uh, my, little did I know, my career was made. <laughs> <laughs> But then you, you also started looking at the long series of employment and labor yeah. share and, well, and things like that. Yeah, I'm, I am, uh, as, a, as a theorist, as an economic theorist, I'm a middle-brow theorist. I'm not a fancy theorist, and I'm not much interested in theory for its own sake. And I'm not much interested in generality, in, in great generality. Uh, what I like to do is, is uh, uh, remember that uh, I'm a depression child. And, uh, and that matters a lot, I think, in terms of, of my orientation toward, toward economics. And I, I wanted, if, if, if I thought I had a better mousetrap in the growth theory line, I wanted it to to tell me something about observation, about uh, uh, data. And so I started, uh, I had a model after all, and the natural thing to do, or a natural thing to do anyhow, is to say, how does this interpret facts? How does this interpret uh, facts? And so I, I started uh, right away. I mean, there was no, no lapse of time. Uh, I started getting together what figures I could that corresponded roughly to the variables of the theory, to the concepts of the model, and see how they fit together. And then, as you know, uh, I, I came upon uh, a really remarkable uh, I can't say fact exactly, implication, a very remarkable implication of the elementary data, which is that what over, by the way, the data I had ran, I think, from 1909 to 1957 for the U.S. Uh, that's not a very long period, but, but for 19... 57, it was a long time series. And those data had the clear implication, once I figured out how to analyze this, uh, had the clear implication that what drove long run productivity increase was not capital accumulation, but was something that I call technical change. Uh, and I'll, I'll continue to call it. Uh, technical change. I was I was just smart enough to realize that in this in this box that I was calling technical change, there were a lot of things, a lot of different kinds of things, including uh, improvement in the quality of of the labor force. But but that it was not capital accumulation, but this thing which is now called total f total factor productivity. Uh, that was driving, was the underlying force behind productivity. So I wrote uh, a, another paper on that in the next year, the first one in 56, the second one in 57, and, uh, and that finished the making of my career. Uh, 
So I got a chance to look at them again. Oh. And reading them from a long time later, there are a number of things that stand out. One is you were still allowed to have an author's voice. And so mm -hmm. one of them begins with the nice segment I've always remembered of yours about what is a theory oh, and yeah. how a theory is a parable. Yeah. And if you had written that today, their red pen would have gotten every you're, you're, single word. You're absolutely right. It would have been, it was too informal a way of talking. And also, I don't think people would approve of the, of the idea <laughs> of, of the notion today. Uh, yeah, I thought that uh, a theory was, uh, was a, a, a serious simplification of a very complicated uh, uh, phenomenon. The way a parable is a, is a story that's meant to tell you something, uh, but not about the nitty gritty, not a, necessarily about the uh, details. And so you don't expect the theory to be literally true. Isn't that what I said? Something? That's what you literally said, yes. Yeah. Uh, you don't expect it to be literally true. You just expect it to, uh, to inform you somehow or other, to... to give you some picture of the way things uh, are or might, uh, uh, or might be. And that, you're right, that's, that's not the way people do things anymore. Usually they start today, axiom one, axiom two, axiom three, and that, that, I'm, uh, that's just not my, uh, my preference for doing this sort of thing. Well. It's not yours either, but it's true. Yeah. But the old papers are much more readable. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I think uh, they're more fun, and uh, and and uh, uh, I do think of, I still think of writing a paper as one end of a conversation, and you have to imagine what the other party to the conversation, whether it's Peter Burke or or someone else, uh, what they're thinking and in a, in a sense saying in return. So you, that, that's the way you, you proceed. Uh, and uh, that's like teaching in my mind. And uh, uh, so I, t I tend to write papers <coughs> the way a teacher would write papers. Or sometimes I write papers why uh, the way a very irritated person writes uh, a paper if I'm annoyed at something, but, uh, but I try to suppress that most of the time. So I think those are the papers that give rise to the representative agent models. There's perfect foresight buried in them. There's, there's all the things that you would need to take this next step. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, I don't know whether, I'm, oh, I'm sure what I'm about to say was not in my mind in, <coughs> in 1956 or, or 1957, but I was thinking about the long run, and I was thinking about a sort of tranquil economy, an economy that was, that was, behaving smoothly and easily through time. And, and for that, I don't mind so much <coughs> the aggregation it, to, if you like, a representative agent. But nowhere in, that paper, in, in those papers is there anything like an optimizing representative agent the, this is, to, dr to make a, a, a really sharp contrast, uh, some people like the, the thought that the economy is tracing out a path with some permanent meaning. Where I think that most of economic life is one damn thing after another. And, and uh, I was getting away for the growth theory purposes from the one damn thing after another. Well, we have a few minutes left, like about 10, so there's <coughs> just a couple more things I'd like you to talk about. Yeah. You like to talk about old times, don't you? Yeah. 
Well, I understand the the newer times. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's harder to understand the older the time. times uh -huh. or what the difference is. But intergenerational equity, you got you got interested in renewable and exhaustible well, resources somewhere around 1974, which is also ancient. Yes. Um, how did you get interested in that? Oh, that was by irritation. Uh, I got interested in, in natural resource economics from reading the limits to growth, the Club of Rome stuff, which uh, you may remember, others may, may not remember, was a sort of uh, doomsday story. We are uh, going to run out of things and we are on a path which will run us out of, of stuff uh, uh, quite soon in, uh, in, thinkable, in thinkable time and there is very little to be done about it without a really drastic uh, intervention of one kind or another. And I read that if you would, were inter if you know if you're a person who was teaching courses and being interested in growth theory and you saw a book with getting a lot of publicity called the limits to growth you would naturally read it and i was struck by the absence of economics from the uh from the book uh there was no talk of the price system no talk of markets no talk of interest rates uh, uh, all those things that would matter so uh since i knew i uh, I know I didn't like it, and I knew why I didn't like it. I, a natural thing to do would be to say, well, how would, uh, how should economics go after this question of stuff, resources that can be run out of? Uh, and so I uh, I started thinking about it, and I read a little bit of, uh, I read, there wasn't much literature, and uh, of course I came upon uh, Hotelling's paper, which is the one one would, would naturally find, and uh, I, did, I did two things. I started to work on it, and I decided to teach course, because they, they came about, you know, those, those are part of the same thing to, uh, to me. And, and uh, uh, so I did that for quite a while. So one of the things you did is got interested in intergenerational equity. Now, of course, this has come back with a real vengeance because the difference between, say, uh, Nordhaus and Stern is exactly on that point. They agree on absolutely everything except should we discount the future at about 7% like Ken Arrow generally has us do? Or is something much closer to zero yeah. the right number? Yeah. So that turns out to be the policy question of the day. Yeah, I, I, I got interested, but obviously if you, if, if you think, as I thought first, of what you might call the positive theory of, of uh, exhaustible resources, non-renewable uh, resources, you would then begin to think about the, the, the uh, uh, what's the word, it's not coming to me, the normative, the normative theory. Also, I have to say, I had read at about that time Jack Rawls's theory of justice. So the, the thought of, of how to do equity or justice was in my head and and uh, I began to think about what what a wise person would would urge as the way to share the natural resources across time, across generations, and uh, uh, and it was also it was natural to think in terms of equalizing across generations. And there came something interesting too, the. I discovered, which I hadn't anticipated at all, that under not implausible circumstances, to use an academic phrase, uh, even with a, an exhaustible resource, an essential exhaustible resource, it 
might be possible to maintain a constant positive level of consumption for infinite time. Uh, so that, that, that turned to be interesting, although I do have a little bit of difficulty with the concept of infinite time. <laughs> and when you get to be 86 years old, the concept of infinite time seems even a little more uh, out of the ordinary. So that would seem pretty naturally to lead you into the, the little bit you wrote on sustainability. Uh, yeah, I, so I, I, well, also sustainability was in the, was again in the air. There was the, the UN report, Brundtland. the, the Brundtland report from the Norwegian uh, prime minister. And uh, uh, <clears throat> so I, I got, I got interested in the, it's natural to go from intergenerational equity to sustainability. And once again, the economics was missing from so much of the popular discussion because sustainability seemed to consist of uh, leaving everything as you found it. Uh, whereas any economist would say that, that the right way to think about sustainability is to, is not to, handicap the well-being of the future. Uh, if, the, if the giant sequoias have to go, God forbid, uh, but if they do have to go, then they have to go if, if that's what's, what's needed. So uh, I, I got interested in sustainability defined as maintaining a level of social welfare or social well-being over, over time, which still seems to me to be the right way to, uh, to do it. it. Also, by the way, it, it bugged me a little. Why should we be so interested in preserving natural resources for the future and not man-made things for the future? Uh, if you had to choose between cutting down the giant sequoias and and blowing up the Parthenon, which would you uh, do? I don't know. I hope it doesn't come to that. Well, I don't think it will come to that. Mm -hmm. Certainly not in in the next two minutes, which mm -hmm. I think is what are we are down to. So, is there any last parting thing you'd like to leave the the camera with? Well, I, let let's go back to your your twenty one year old. Uh, uh, married couple who who think they want to be economists. Uh, there's there are some some pretty good issues left for economists to worry about. The I think that the the a deeper version of sustainability and how to achieve the best thing you can. Uh, through a modified market system is a, is a problem that in large respects is still out there. The, the question of, uh, of economic growth is still out there. Uh, the que demographic questions, population, and what that means for the lungs still out there. So uh, if I were a 21-year-old couple, uh, I would think that there, uh, by the way, very good to have one micro and one macro uh, uh, person there. I think there's still uh, a lot, a lot to do, and even a lot to do for middle brows. Thank you. Yeah.